Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. So many good news, but not today. Deadline saves have been on a long quizzes, uh, part two and exam part one. Deadline of five, May 28th, end of day, 9.59 p.m. Exam two, quizzes part three, deadline of five, June 9th. Exam three, deadline of five, June 17th. Uh, exam four, quizzes part four, exam five, deadline of five, June 18th. For the paper, if you want to do a draft, uh, you can turn as many copies as you want. Let's set up, put comments on them, send a grade, get it back to you. And you can revise them as many times as you like until either you get the grade you want or you just get sick of the process or time comes to an end. And time ends on June 10th for the draft. The plus five deadline is June 11th for the full credit deadline, June 15th, and for half credit on June 18th. And then the grades go in on June 19th. And that's that. Okay, Before, what did you say the quiz and the exam close tonight? Uh, 11.59.59 p.m. But I, I actually, I did because I, uh, a while back I mistakenly put May 29th on there. But since I said it, I kind of obligated to it, so we, it actually deadlines May 29th. So, because uh, my mistake. <laughs> but it happened until 11.59 tomorrow to finish it. Okay, any uh, thing about any stuff that is to be, stuff that is been, or stuff stuff? I have a question about, um, and this might be the wrong time to ask it, but I always remember and then I forget, so I'd rather ask it now. Okay. Um, I, it says I was absent on 520, mm -hmm. and that day I was here, I just didn't get a chance to sign the roll. Oh, that's fine. So that's okay. What yeah. are you going to do about that? Um, you just put yourself down as, as being there. You just want me right on top of the line? Sure, that's fine. You sure? I'm sure. Okay, I'll put a star next to it. So okay. You know it's Two stars. Two stars. <laughs> <laughs> That way I know it's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to um, be messed about it. No, that's fine. Here, anything else? Okay, so last time looking at our good dead friend Plato talking about his, you know, Plato stuff. Now, Plato basically has the following things that he wants to argue against. He wants to argue against the idea that knowledge is just opinion, you know, true opinion. Just believing something, getting it right. Although that does have a certain appeal. You know, we, we think of it, you know, someone knows something, they get it right, and they believe it. But he thinks there should be something more. He also wants to argue against uh, relativism, the idea that truth is not objective, that it depends on the culture. And thirdly, he wants to go up against empiricism, the idea that what you know comes to the senses. So kind of his three main opponents are the idea that knowledge is just true belief, just get, having opinions that are correct, against relativism, and against senses as the basis of knowledge. Now his argument against relativism is something we've seen before. It comes from a Theodetus, and he does acknowledge that some things are relative. You know, to use kind of an easy example, uh, temperature where there's something, you know, there's an objective in a way of temperature, but how it feels to a person is relative. So, for example, someone from, say, Puerto Rico would feel cooler at a temperature than someone from, say, Maine, where I'm from, would feel rather warm. And so some things can be relative. But Plato says that relativism itself is self-refuting, which you saw that, you know, basically I stole the art from Plato back in the ancient days of the first week. And it's that classic argument. If we accept that all claims are, you know, all opinions are equally good, the opinion that that view is wrong is equally good. So roughly put, if that claim is true, it's false, and of course if it's false, it's false. Which is either a very clever argument or just a trick, or both. He also argues specifically against a fellow named Protagoras, who was a sophist who would, you know, offer to teach people how to succeed for, you know, a modest amount of gold or silver. And there's an argument against Pythagoras. So against Pythagoras was, well, if someone believes in relativism and they offer to teach people stuff, there'd be no reason to pay them because if all opinions are equally good, it's all relative, but why pay someone when you get stuff for free? So if everyone's opinion is equally good, why pay someone for what you can just make up yourself for nothing? So keep your gold. 
So that's how he kind of rolls through relativism. Now, kind of his big opponent, though, is empiricism. That he, you get knowledge through the senses. And this is kind of the big, the big classic battle in you know, the theory of knowledge. Can we know stuff by pure reason, or does knowledge come through our senses? In many ways, if you look at kind of modern science, the claim is you know, it's all empirical, so the senses of one. But then people in the science do all the you know, mathematical stuff. They love talking about cosmology and parallel worlds. So they sneak that metaphysics back in. But here's the first problem of the senses, the problem of change. And here's the problem. The world, as everyone's probably noticed, changes quite a bit. Moment to moment, everything is changing. In fact, uh, one of the really old dead guys, a guy named Heraclitus, said the world is fire. And he also said that you can never step in the same river twice, in the sense that if you puff in the river and jump out, the water keeps on going. You jump in again, not the same same river. And so the world does seem to change constantly. So a good question would be, so what's the problem? The world changes, so why is that a problem? Why is that a problem for knowing stuff? Well, here's a problem. If we base our knowledge, or try to base knowledge on the senses, and everything's constantly changing, we cannot have certainty about stuff. All we can say is that it appeared to be this way at a particular time. But things could be different now, and maybe what seemed to be was not really accurate. To use a simple example, if you drove to campus, think about your car. I assume when you left your car, it was not on fire, correct? But do you know your car is not on fire now? Sadly, no. Unless you get like one of those app things that tells you your car is on fire. <laughs> which I guess could be kind of handy. Or maybe you have a smart car, self-driving car to call you, it's like, help me, <laughs> I'm on fire. They used to have talking cars back, way back, and the reason why they stopped making those is because, well, for this following reason, you'd open the door and say, the door is a jar, the door is a jar. And at first it was kind of cool, hey, my car talks. And then it gets super annoying, my car <laughs> talks all the time. But anyways, getting back to the main, main point here, all you can, with your senses, all they give you is what seems to be at a particular time. So there's two basic problems. One is it's as things seem to be. And as we know from optical illusions, you know, magic tricks, what we think we see or hear, not always accurate. And secondly, even if by pure luck we're seeing what's really real for real, so to speak, it's only at a particular time. And so we can't say that we know, for example, that you know, I don't know that my truck's not on fire now or being towed. I hope it's not, but I don't know. So. His claim is, is that the source of knowledge has got to give us not you know, a lack of certainty, and not just at a particular time. It's got to give us certainty and duration. Now, of course, one could argue, as Aristotle did against Plato, about these conditions. But that's what he claims. It's got to be sure about it, and it's got to be like something enduring and lasting, preferably eternal. So he claims senses can't give us knowledge. But Plato's pretty thorough. So one argument is not enough. Fortunately, he doesn't have like eight, but he's got a few. Second problem, problem of definitions. He claims, and again, this could be argued against him, and people have, that the objects of knowledge have to be universal and unchanging. And the reason why is we've got to have unchanging definitions to sort of ground language. And his claim is without this, language would not work. Now people might point out the obvious, like, hey, you know, definitions do, ch you know, words do change. But what he thinks is we do have to have a solid foundation for language, otherwise, to use a crap analogy, it'd be like trying to anchor, you know, your boat using no anchor. You know, just not gonna, not gonna work. Now again, people have argued against Plato on this point, but he thinks that we gotta have these unchanging internal definitions to use language. And of course, people can argue against that, because you can argue anything. Third one is the perfect standard argument, which works like this. And it's actually kind of an interesting practical problem. Here, here's how it goes. One thing we get is 
a knowledge of, or claims of perfection. And we know that physical things fall short of that. We know everything is imperfect. To use a standard you know, example, think of like a drawing a circle. You know, even if you use like a compass, like you know, my use in geometry, it'd be pretty good if you look pretty closely, still not perfect. You could print it out on a computer using a high resolution laser printer, but if you get out like a microscope, you'll see it's still not perfect. And so what we encounter in life, sadly and tragically, is never perfect. So what he claims is, the reason why we know stuff isn't perfect and falls short is because we've got an idea of perfection. But of course we can't get it here, because no matter where you look, no matter where you go, you don't find perfection. So, it can't come to the senses because we never see the perfect. <clears throat> now, interestingly, apparently enough, this does kind of point to an interesting practical problem today, which is the problem of measuring stuff. Now, back in the day, we didn't have to be like super exact. So when we had, you know, technology that was things like, you know, sailboats and you know, building, you know, castles and you know, so forth. We'd have to be, we have to be pretty, you know, close. We'd have to be like super, super exact. And even when we we're building stuff like cars and so on, they'd be pretty close, but not super, super exact. But then we started making stuff like, you know, computers, working at the micro scale, you know, like millions or billions of transistors on little chips. And then matters of length became, the measure became super important. It would be super accurate. And one interesting thing that occurred was that. Well, I'll use a concrete example. In order to measure, say, distance, you got to have a standard to make sure, you know, if you measure anything, you got to make sure your ruler is actually accurate. And that creates a problem of how do you know your ruler is accurate, and how do you tell if it gets accurate. Well, what they used to do is have what's called the standard meter bar, which is made of like this, you know, kind of special metal kept in, you know, inert gas, so it wouldn't, you know, in a particular temperature, it wouldn't shrink or grow. What they found was that well, even that you know, special metal kept in special conditions would actually shrink and grow a little bit. It's, you know, it'd lose you know, some, some matter, be affected by, by something. And so a physical object wouldn't suffice, because we get to the point now of such utter precision, physical objects weren't good enough. So then they redefined the meter based on, I believe, um, the wavelength of a particular type of you know, radiation, and because the physical world wasn't good enough. And so that's a practical example of what Plato's talking about. We've hit the point now where physical measurements, you know, using physical objects like rulers or you know, meter rods or, or weights are good enough. So we, we're working towards better standards. And we might hit a point in our technology where matter is insufficient. Where we'll just hit a point, you know, we'll hit the wall of technology we can't you know, do any more with matter. As anticipated by Plato. Okay, so those three arguments, it basically concludes the senses are out. So quick recap, relativism is out because it's self-refuting. The senses are out because they don't give us certainty and you know, unchangingness. The senses don't provide us with unchanging eternal universal definitions. And the senses don't give us the perfect standard we got to have. So the senses are out. Now, the third thing he's going after is that claim that knowledge is just having the right opinion, believing it, being right. So what's wrong with that? Well, this is what he claims. A true opinion, of course, is better than a false opinion, but he says that what is needed is not just, here's a belief, it has to be correct, but an account of why, namely a rational justification. So you need more than just believing something and getting it right. It's got to be warranted. To use kind of a you know, crap illustration, like the one I used last time. Think of like doing a math problem. A person could just guess, you know, 42, and get it right. But to really know the answer, the person would need to give an account of that. Or it could be something like a, you know, doing a proof in logic or geometry. Or working out an engineering you know, problem. If someone just says, well, I just guessed, we'd say, well, they don't really know, they were just lucky. So for Plato, those are the three main things. Relativism, he thinks is out. Senses, out. 
true opinion without justification out. Before we go on, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? Okay. <clears throat> so given those arguments for Plato, knowledge has got to have the following ingredients. It's got to be objective, say not relative, not by the senses. It's got to be universal, changeless, and based in reason. So he needs something special. And what he comes up with is one of the things that Plato was famous for, in addition to being like, dead and stuff. He comes up with the idea of what are called the forms, or sometimes called the ideas. Now, in a way, ideas is kind of misleading, because for Plato, they're not like ideas in your, your mind. One, um, well, in a way, they're kind of hard to describe, because they're, in a way, totally outside of our three-dimensional space-time experience. But it's kind of the idea. They are supposed to exist outside of space and time, which seems kind of weird. So what are these things supposed to be like? What are they supposed to do? Well, what they do is this. They divide the world into categories. And there are what are called particulars, which are individuals, which are sometimes referred to Excuse me. It's all the all the pixels coming, all that eight, eight bit pixels coming off the screen. <laughs> but there are pic, uh, particulars, sometimes called tokens. You know, like in a game, you know, tokens, you know, pieces like a monopoly. And these are the individuals. For example, I'm a particular, you're a particular. You know, we're all particulars. We're all individuals. But there are also categories or types, and these are, you know, classes of things. So, for example, we're all individual people, but we belong to the category of people. And so you've got the individuals grouped into types. The universal, or form, or idea for Plato, one of the things it does is it groups stuff. So one classic question in metaphysics is, what makes all things in a class of that class? What makes all people people? What makes all chairs chairs? All kiwis kiwis? Either the fruit or the bird. And Plato's answer is the form. Now, the forms are kind of super weird. First, they are eternal. They are un presumably uncreated and never go into existence. They exist forever and ever. They're also changeless, so they never alter. They are pure, eternal, and perfect. And they're also singular, so the forms just have one quality. To give some examples, They'd be the form of beauty. It would be eternal, unchanging, perfect beauty. Or justice. Perfect, unchanging, eternal justice. Or the form of human. Perfect, unchanging, eternal human. Or the form of anything. Now, of course, you know, people did raise the, even Plato himself raised this concern. Are there forms for, like, yucky things? And the answer is seen they have to would have to be like forms for like, you know, you know, vomit or saliva or mold. Because whatever you got, you get a perfect form for it. There'd be like that perfect, you know, shower mold, <laughs> eternal, changeless and eternal. Which may explain why it's so hard to get rid of that that stuff. So kind of the weird quality they got is these things are eternal, unique, changeless, and perfect. Or so we call Now, the way they interact, supposedly, if that's even the correct word of the world, is this. According to Plato, the stuff down here participates or imitates, whatever that means, it's totally mysterious, with these forms. One way to illustrate it in kind of a crappy way is this. Think of um, like a music CD. I assume they might still sell such things. <laughs> now, of course, you get like the original, you know, where you have the sort of the, when they record an album, you have like the, the original. And so that'd be like the original recording. And you kind of think of that as the form. And back, you know, when they were doing things like, you know, records and, you know, lower quality, you know, digital, you know, audio, usually the copies were slightly, you know, inferior. 
you kind of like photocopies. You know, back when photocopiers were kind of crappy, you could always tell a photocopy because it was you know increasingly you know, crappy. And then you have you know the original, you know the master you know recording, and then of course you make copies of that. And if you use you know if you do like digital audio, you you know that if you're into it, you know you can set various levels of compression. You know, make the files smaller or use different types of you know, compression schemes, and give you know trade quality for smaller files. And of course, this was a big deal back when MP3 players had like you know megabytes instead of gigabytes. You really had to crush those songs down, and they'd have lower and lower quality. So you kind of think of the form as like the original track recorded you know in the studio, super high quality, or like with a movie. You know, they're recorded like, you know, super high quality using, you know, the, the IMAX cameras. And then, of course, you can have lesser and lesser, you know, copies. This would be like the, we'll go with the movie. This would be like the original recording, IMAX, you know, 3D cameras. This would be shown in the theater and the IMAX. This would be like, you know, non-IMAX. This would be like getting it on DVD. This would be like a crappy pirated copy, you know, off the interwebs, uh, etc. And so you'd have things copying the, the perfect original that are lower in quality. Or to use another crappy analogy, think of like little photocopiers. And you copy and you copy and you copy, and it's <coughs> worse and worse. So that's kind of, kind of how the forms, they're like the perfect original that everything else imitates or duplicates, whatever that is. Now a good question would be is, since the forms are not here, you can't like go to Australia and you know, find the forms or go to like Canada and find one hanging out. Good question is, how do we know about these things if we don't get into the senses? And Plato gives an answer that is both kind of, <laughs> kind of creepy, but I guess also kind of in a way reassuring. And the answer is this. You learn about these things, according to Plato, when you're dead. And if Plato's right, we've all been dead lots of times. <laughs> this is like our who knows how many lifetimes. And if you ever wonder why education hurts, because according to Plato, you learn the most when you're dead. So you probably think, you know, that education is killing you, which apparently it is. Now, in his Plato's dialogue with Mino, Mino lays forth the following, you know, apparent paradox. If you know, already know, then there's no need to learn. But if you don't know, you won't know when you find what you're looking for because you don't know what you're looking for. So there's an, according to Mino's paradox, there's no way to learn. Now put like in a kind of a less formal, kind of more crappy way, it's kind of like, you know, if you know where something is, you don't have to find out where it is because you know where it is. And if you don't know what it is you're looking for, you have no idea if you have found it because you don't even know what you're looking for. So how does he solve this problem? Well, he fixes it this way. According to Plato, this is what happens. When we're alive and hanging out here, you know, on Earth, we've got, at least on one account, you know, the soul hanging out in the ball. And then we die. And what happens, at least on in the account of Amino, is the soul goes off to what people call the Platonic heaven. You know, not here, not in space, not in time. And then the soul kind of hangs out or communes with the forms. And this all sounds pretty weird, because it is pretty pretty weird. But what happens is, according to Plato, once you've been communing with the forms, you know, you, you hang out with, like, perfect beauty. You hang out with perfect justice. You hang out with perfect circle. And I guess, you know, hang with cool forms. Probably people avoid, like, the form of perfect vomit. Probably not a lot of people hang in with that. And then what happens, according to Plato, is you're reborn. And in some, some accounts, it's like a, you spend a thousand years dead, and then you pick your, in, in one of his, you know, sort of uh, stories, what he says is that what you do is you pick your next life. So it's like, like in a video game. You know, you're selecting what character you're going to play. You pick your, your life. And then you're, you're reincarnated. And then you go through it all again. But a good question might be to ask Plato is, but, uh, you know, Plato, I don't seem to remember all this, this stuff. Well, here's his answer. The shock of being reborn means basically you con your conscious memory of it is gone. To use a, a modern analogy, it's kind of like if you ever had uh, like the hard drive on your computer or like the um, 
you know, like one of your, like a flash drive or the memory, like in your smartphone, where like you drop it or you know, something goes wrong and you can't access your drive. Well, unless the hard drive is like physically destroyed, that data is still there. It's just you can't get to it for whatever reason because you know, damaged directory, etc. What is why is you know, a bit of advice. If you have like a phone or a laptop or something and you have stuff you don't want people getting into, merely like erase deleting stuff doesn't actually remove it. And you have to basically overwrite the drive. Which is why people who are like really paranoid, they take their drives out and put them in a shredder, because that way it's hard to get back. But unless you actually overwrite it, all that stuff is still there. So if you ever like get a new computer and sell your old one, you always want to like get a, either reform it entirely from using the factory, re, you know, reinstall the factory condition, or erase it and overwrite it. Because otherwise, it's pretty easy to dig stuff up from your drives. And then people will do that. They go around for real. They go around to like dumpsters and stuff, getting people's hard drives because they know there's all kinds of cool stuff like bank account numbers, um, personal information, etc. Because people are awful, <laughs> as a general rule. Now, so imagine you know your memory is like that hard drive. So when you're reborn, your directory is screwed up. So all that stuff is stored in there, but you can't you can't get to it. But according to Plato, what happens is this. Just like with, you know, if your hard drive goes bad or flash drive goes bad, you can often, you know, recover. You're using disk utilities, etc., and you can regain that information. And Plato contends that philosophy, in a way, is like that disk utility of the soul. That by engaging in the philosophical dialectic, you, by being asked the right questions, you recall stuff. Your memory starts returning. And to, to try to prove this, in the Mino, the character of Socrates goes through and he's talking to one of uh, Mino's uh, servants. And he walks him through a proof in geometry. And he, he asks, you know, did this person ever learn geometry? And of course he says, you know, no. But then he asks him these questions about, you know, doing a, a geometric proof. And the person gets, when asked the questions, gets all the answers right. And so Plato concludes that the person must have learned geometry not in this lifetime, but sometime when he wasn't alive. In other words, he was hanging out with the forms of geometry, and it was all in there, it just had to be reminded of it. Now critics, of course, say, well, Socrates is just asking you know, leading questions. You, know, you, ask, you ask questions a certain way, and you can get the answer you want. But what he claims, you know, his claim is essentially that we forget all this stuff until we're asked the right questions, and then we we remember, we recollect it, or so he claims. So, when do you learn about all these forms? When you're dead. Why don't you remember them? Because the shock of being reborn kind of busts up your hard drive. How do you learn about them later? Well, get asked the right questions. And then the memories come, it's like, kind of like a repressed memory. The memory comes back, or so he claims. So for Plato, learning in a way is not learning new stuff, it's remembering what you already know. Now, a fair question is, and, you know, some you know, clever may think, hey, are like the winning lottery numbers in there too? You know, just store it away, and if I just ask myself the right questions, I get the winning lottery numbers for tomorrow, or know who's gonna win like the, you know, the World Cup or the World Series or the Super Bowl, which would be pretty handy. Unfortunately, for Plato, the knowledge that's in there is not like empirical stuff. So. The winning numbers for like next week's lottery, sadly, not in there. The winner of you know the World Cup, not in there. I know it's not gonna be not gonna be the World Cup though. Those FIFA guys got arrested. I mean, maybe they will. Maybe they'll beat the charges. Who knows? But um, stuff like that, like where your electric keys, not in there. It's things like what is you know justice, geometry, etc. Before pressing along, anything about how we learn when we're dead <laughs> that needs more stuff. So if you ever wonder why learning hurts, that's why. Because <laughs> you learn the most when you're, when you're dead. So you remember that. Oh my god, this is killing me. Because it literally is. Okay, so that's a little epistemology. Now we turn to a bit of Plato's metaphysics. Now, the forms, again, are kind of multifunction things. They serve as the objects of knowledge, so they're epistemic things. But of course, they're also metaphysical entities. They're real, in fact, they're the realest of the real, the most real of all. They're objective, independent, unchanging, 
they're not in space, they're not in time. Now, that of course seems kind of weird because we spend all our time in space and time. And one might wonder, like, what would it be to be outside of space and time? Now, fortunately or unfortunately, as you know, we've gotten you know better at you know, physics and stuff. We have notions of, of dimensions that are not you know spatial or temporal. You know, it comes up in like sci-fi sometimes, like you know the fifth dimension or the seventh dimension or eighth dimension. But we do have those concepts that there could be you know that our three dimensions are just the three we kind of hang out in. But we have you know mathematical descriptions of others. There could be multiple dimensions. And it used to be a thing for like sci-fi. But, you know, people in physics are taking it seriously that there could be, right now, we could be like, kind of like, not really in, but kind of in, a world of multiple dimensions. So, there could be beings, like six dimensional beings, just kind of like walking through us, you know. Walking. Maybe they can see us, maybe they can't. Um, who knows? But it's kind of creepy in a way. It's like being haunted <laughs> all the time. And so it makes in a way more sense now, that we have dimensions that aren't spatial or temporal. Oh, horror movies, especially like that. Like H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, uh, Dead Guy wrote a lot of stuff. And a lot of horror is based on his stuff about other dimensions where everything is bad and comes through to like mess with us. It's all bad. But Plato's forms are, are nice because they're all perfect, you know, eternal and don't do horrible things. Now, one of the main problems for these universals is what's called the participation problem. The problem is this. If these things are outside of space and time, how do they interact with stuff here? So, for example, me being human is because I participate in the form of human, how does that work? And that's considered like one of the main criticisms. They're just weird and mysterious. And people say, you know, Plato, that stuff's weird and mysterious. And of course Plato would say back, it's all weird and mysterious. Now, so why does Plato want to have like this double scenario, perfect forms, imperfect world? Well, part of it again is, you know, the epistemology thing. You know, we clearly have this imperfect world here, but he wants to postulate another world that is got perfect stuff. And where he's getting his influence from, <coughs> two dead guys. Heraclitus, who I mentioned before, and Parmenides, whose name sounds kind of like a cheese. It's like if you went to an Italian restaurant, they might ask you, up a little grinder and say, would you like some Parmenides on your, you know, spaghetti? And be sure to answer no, because it's not a cheese. Parmenides is people. You don't want that on your spaghetti. Kind of like soil and green. You don't want it either. Because soil and green is also people. Now, the paradox of change is this. It's that in order for something to change, paradoxically, something has to remain the same. Because if nothing remains the same, then it's actually destroyed and not change. Now, Thinkers, you know, address this, you know, problem throughout the centuries. And one thing that we'll see when we talk about personal identity is the problem of, like, how much can something change and still be the same thing? And one of the most famous examples is the ship of Theseus. Theseus was the guy who went to battle the Minotaur. So that's his kind of his claim to fame, defeating the Minotaur. And in the problem, the idea is, you know, suppose you have the ship of Theseus. Or we could use, if you want to modify, you know, bring it up to the modern age, you could use like the car or computer on Theseus. So the idea is you start taking pieces off the ship and replacing them, just like you might replace like a house or anything. And the question kind of is like at what point if you just start taking off all kinds of stuff, how much can you remove it's still the same ship? And this of course is a philosophical problem, you know, how much can you remove before it ceases to be the same thing? But it's also a practical problem for the people who like, you know, history and you know, historical artifacts. So if you got, say, an old ship like the Constitution, for example, and you're replacing pieces of it, at what point does it stop being the Constitution? And when does it start becoming just a flesh, a replica? Or if we want to talk about people, one thing we'll talk about in personal identity is, you know, we already have the power, or the power, we already have the ability, the technology, to replace parts. If a person loses, like, a leg, they can get a replacement leg. If they lose an eye, they're working on cyber optics, and they're working on artificial ears and hearts, etc. And so someday, just like you can get replacement parts for your, your car, you'd be able to get full replacement parts for your body. Go shopping for like some new lungs, maybe. 
Maybe it's new eyes. Maybe you're tired of your eyes. They're the wrong color or the wrong shape. Go get some new ones. Get some with like other built-in features. And so the kind of the question would be is how much can you take out and still be you? Now turning to Heraclitus, he said, I mentioned before, that the world is fire, that everything is constant change, there is no permanence. And he had that saying, you can never step into the same river twice. So change is real, permanence is an illusion. Parmenides had the opposite view. He claimed that change was the illusion and nothing actually changed, which intuitively seems wrong, because it does seem like things are, you might say, Parmenides, uh, pretty clearly stuff's, you know, happening. Now what Plato does is works out a compromise, a platonic compromise, as opposed to like a platonic friendship. And what he does is this. Following Heraclitus, he makes the world of particulars, the world we live in, the world of change. So nothing stays the same, nothing is permanent, everything changes. Which is, you know, pretty much our experience in life. Everything, the more things you know, change, the more they change. But he also follows Parmenides by making the forms perfect, eternal, and changeless. So it ends up like with a double, you know, reality. The forms unchanging, perfect, etc., and then the imperfect, changing world that we. <coughs> now, in our world, where we live, it's a world of particulars. Again, individuals. You know, examples would be like us, everything around us. Now, as I mentioned, for Plato, reality comes in degrees. One way to, to sort of illustrate this, you can take the example of beauty. Are some people more beautiful than others? Yeah, so we're going to be supermodels. Some people don't. Are some people taller than others? Yes. Are some, you know, court cases handled with more justice than others? Yeah. And so reality, you know, does come in groups, more and less. And you could, you know, use beauty, justice, size, you know, goodness, tastiness, inequality. Now, again, as I mentioned, the forms are supposed to cause all this stuff. So if you take like a supermodel, why is a supermodel beautiful? Because she resembles perfect beauty to a degree. Why is like a certain court case ruling just? Because it resembles perfect justice more than other cases. Now, so one thing the forms do is they make everything what it is. So why are we all human? Well, we somehow participate in the form of human. Why are beautiful people beautiful? They participate in beauty. Now, they also do, in addition to like making things what they are, they also do the grouping thing, breaking things into categories. So I'm human because, according to Plato, I'm somehow connected to the form of human. But I also belong to the category or class of humans because that is what organizes everything to those classes. I mean, to use a crappy analogy, you can kind of think of like a blueprint if, or a design. If think of like, um, suppose you like the MacBook Air. And your MacBook Air is similar to all the other ones because they're built on the same blueprint. They're all in a way, you think of the blueprint as the form, they're all similar because they follow that blueprint. So that's what he claims. So they do two main things. They make things what they are, and they group things. Now there's all kinds of interesting boring problems here, um, which spread into not just like sort of speculative metaphysics, but into you know, things like real politics and social issues. For example, one example in terms of categories would be something like race. You know, we recognize that being human is a you know a real thing. You know, there's a genetic difference between say me and say a kiwi, a fruit, or the bird. But then the question is: race a real category, or is it a social construct? And that, of course, has many real implications. Another one torn from today's headlines is the issue of gender. Now, sex is biological. You know, it's a matter of, you know, plumbing and genetics. But then gender is seen as something different. And so the question would be, is gender 
are those real categories, or are they just sort of you know constructs? We're just kind of making stuff up. And that of course does does matter. And so that's a case where metaphysics you know hits you know social, political, and value theory, and people fight a lot about that stuff. Okay, before pressing on, anything about that stuff that needs any more. Now, two of Plato's really famous things are the famous line and the famous allegory of the cave. Have you ever seen the movie The Matrix? Which was, came out, well, 16 years ago. Pretty old. Seems like just 16 years ago it came out. Uh, Canoe Reeves, and it's great acting. Now, if you saw the movie The Matrix, you've already seen the allegory of the cave. It, I mean, of course, it's got a better budget and lots of explosions and lots of guns, but it is essentially the allegory of the cave. And one way to sort of like understand it in a way that's like not boring is watching The Matrix. The first one. Now, I don't recommend watching the second or the third because not so good. Stick with the first one. Now, Plato, <coughs> not surprisingly, wants to divide people up into <coughs> two categories the philosophers, and people who aren't philosophers. Now, by philosopher, he doesn't necessarily mean people who like to get academic degrees, because back then he would really have those. But he wants to distinguish between people who are like, well, the way he does it basically is people who are thinking about the forms, philosophers. People focusing on stuff here, not. Now, he begins his discussion with the one and the many. What does that mean? Well, what he lays out is this. If we take, um, Oh, say beauty and ugly. There are two things because they're not the same. Beauty is not the same as ugliness. Each one is one, so there are two. And the many, for him, are all the combinations of those. So the way he looks at it is you take like all the, the beautiful and ugly things. There's nothing that's perfectly beautiful in this world, nothing that's perfectly ugly. It's a blend. The most beautiful thing or person still isn't perfectly beautiful. The most ugly thing a person is still not perfectly ugly, or so he claims. Now, the people who are lovers of sounds and sights are people who think that, you know, in a way you could see them as being kind of biased or prejudiced. There are people who think that this, what we're experiencing, is really real for real. But of course, for those people, life is but a dream because they're not seeing the true reality. Now, interestingly, morally enough, what he's presenting here is kind of the opposite of what people usually think. You know, if someone is thinking about, like, really abstract stuff, you're doing the philosophy stuff, people say, oh, you know, you're not realistic, you're daydreaming, etc. But Plato kind of flips it on its head by saying the people who are focused on the stuff here, what they see and hear, they're the ones living in a dream. The people who are truly awake are the ones who are seeing <coughs> the really real, for real. Now, to illustrate this, if you've seen uh, The Matrix, it's kind of that deal. You know, you can think of the world of sights and sounds as like being in The Matrix. It seems real, but it's totally not the real, real. And of course, in The Matrix, the, the real world is just, you know, more sights and sounds, but for Plato, there's the truly <coughs> real world. Now, he, of course, wants to continue his distinction between knowledge and opinion. His goal is to find out what this knowledge is. So, what is it? Well, here he lays out arguments as to why, you know, what he's doing is basically creating kind of a spectrum of stuff. There's ignorance, which is know nothing. There's opinion, which is more than ignorance, but less than knowledge. And then there's knowledge. So he wants to create kind of a spectrum of knowy stuff. Now, if you know, you know something. Because you, well, someone could say they know nothing, but in a way you can't know nothing. Except Socrates, of course, says that. So he thinks that absolute beauty, being absolute, can be absolutely known, or so he claims. And something that is utterly non existent is utterly unknown because there's nothing to know. So you literally can't know nothing. 
Now, given his metaphysics, there's like a middle ground between like absolute being and absolute nothing. There's the stuff in between. So anything that can be and not be, that is to say the things that are mixed, will be between pure being and absolute negation. What does that mean? Well, you got the perfect stuff, the forms. You got the nothingness, which is nothing, and then all the stuff in between. You know, all the world we live in. And on his view, knowledge corresponds to that absolute stuff. You know, be perfect beauty, etc. And ignorance, of course, corresponds to nothing. Because if one is ignorant, one knows bless you, nothing. So this is perfect stuff. This is nothing and opinions <coughs> in between. Or so he claims. Now his next argument, he likes to argue, is the spheres and faculties argument. Here's how it goes. Now a view that was common, you know, in Plato's time, still common today, is this idea of faculties. Everyone's probably heard this expression. I mean faculty like, you know, people are like teaching. But, you know, faculties, we, we often say, uh, think of our senses as like faculties, you know, faculty of sight, hearing, etc. But people also like to put faculties in, you know, the mind. Like, for example, people who do stuff in art and aesthetics might talk about the faculty of, you know, aesthetic sense or the moral sense. And so Plato has a view that we, do, we have these powers in us, you know, faculties for doing things. And he claims, seemingly correctly, things that have the same sphere, the same domain, and the same result have the same faculty. Things that have different spheres and different results are not surprisingly different. And, but his point is basically, you know, roughly put, things that are different are different, and things that are the same, the same. And so knowledge and opinion are both faculties. So we have the capacity of knowledge, capacity of opinion, but he says they cover different things. So they're not the same. He doesn't use this sort of analogy, but he uses a following crappy analogy. Seeing and hearing are both faculties, but they don't. We see different things than we hear. We see, you know, shapes and colors. We hear sounds in general. Interestingly, there are some people who can see colors and hear. I'm uh, oh, sorry, see sounds and hear colors, but that's you know, kind of usual stuff. And so he seems to be right. You know, the faculty of knowing, the faculty of opinion, separate stuff. <clears throat> so, since they're different, he thinks that absolute being is a sphere of knowledge. And knowledge is to know, for him, the nature of being. Opinion, of course, is to have an opinion. And since these are different, <coughs> knowledge and opinion aren't the same. So, smushing that down. <laughs> Knowledge and opinion are about different stuff, therefore they're different. Again, using my crappy analogy, seeing deals with, you know, colors and shapes, hearing with sounds. Shapes are, you know, sounds or colors, so they're different, you know, things. Therefore, the faculties are different. Now, what about the not being? Well, he claims that not being is not the subject of opinion. Why not? Well, you get an opinion, you get an opinion about something, not about nothing. Although apparently you can have a show about nothing, which apparently was the whole thing of Seinfeld, apparently a show about nothing. So since you can't have an opinion about nothing, if you get an opinion, you get an opinion about something, not nothing. So not being is one thing, it's not one thing, but nothing. So through all of those convoluted arguments, he breaks it down like this. Knowledge deals with absolute being, the forms. Opinion deals with stuff that's less than absolute, but more than nothing. It's not nothing, and it's not absolute. And this is the world of particulars. And then ignorance deals with, you get nothing. And so that's his breakdown of the categories. Knowledge, opinion, ignorance. Before pressing on, anything about coin <laughs> that needs more So opinion is the middle ground, the intermediate between knowing stuff and nothing, and so it's an intermediate. So his view is basically it's that middle middle ground. So what's then the problem with opinion? 
Well, basically his view is this. Opinion involves that kind of mixing of stuff. The beautiful will be seen as ugly. How so? Well, we can take a concrete example. Think of, um, think of like if you ever looked at like a picture or a painting or a statue, you know, some, something in art. And you're looking at it and one person says, oh, that's beautiful. Another person says, oh, God, that's, that's ugly. Or we can take the example of like, um, ooh, not as beauty, but you take things, well, if you take like justice. When you have a, you know, we have controversial cases recently, and some people say, oh, that was a just rule, and other people say, no, that's totally unjust. And so we see, in matters of opinion, we see that blending. And in a way, you could say, everyone can be kind of right, because there is no, since there is no perfect justice, it's always, you could always say, well, that was not just, because it wasn't, it wasn't perfectly just. But of course, since there is no perfect injustice, you could say, well, it's got at least a little bit of justice in there, maybe just a drop, <laughs> but more than nothing. Now, so he thinks that these ideas of the world here are basically halfway. They're more than nothing, but not the absolute. They're just kind of half beliefs. So they're mere opinion and not knowledge. Or so he thinks. And so he divides things up between the people who are lovers of wisdom and lovers of the sights and sounds. The people who love the sights and sounds see the many things, but they do not see the absolute. They see the many beautiful things, but do not see absolute beauty. It's kind of like... Um, uh, I remember people used to put up these like little printouts saying, you know, um, some people just talk about you know things, then but you know people, other people talk about ideas. And it's kind of reference indirectly to Plato. You know, this is like crudely put. This is kind of like you know gossipy stuff, and then thinking about the forms would be like concerned about the real stuff. Now this of course can be seen as some type of like um, elitism. You know that being concerned about the world here is yeah. And you should be thinking about all these abstract ideas, etc. And then, of course, some people will kind of, you know, reverse that. The idea being that this is where all attention should be focused, you know, here, now, and physical stuff here. We shouldn't be concerned about things like ideas, things like justice or beauty. We should focus on concrete stuff, you know, money in the bank, bread in the oven, you know, um, you know, concrete on the street type of stuff. So... The many, you know, see the stuff here, but don't know. And what is known for Plato is the absolute, namely the forms which are known and not seen, because they're not empirical. So they don't see the stuff here, or so he claims. <coughs> now, he likes analogies, as all philosophers do. And one good question is, so how do we, like, know about this stuff? And he says... The soul is like the eye, and it has to be like, you know, turned to see things. And how then do we see stuff? Well, here's how he sort of lays out his analogy. In the physical world, which we hang out in, there, of course, is the sun. And, of course, we have, like, now we have electronic lighting, etc. But you know, back then they obviously had fire and so forth. That it's how we see the world. And one thing that makes a really good analogy or metaphor, and it's really stuck. For example, we talk about if someone gains understanding, we talk about them being enlightened. Or when we're drawing a cartoon and we want to show a character getting an idea, what do we draw? Well, a picture, but what do we draw over the person's head? This is all a cloud. Yeah, you can draw a for what they're thinking, but if we show the person, like, boom, gets an idea suddenly, they have a, light. yeah, a light bulb, boom, they're enlightened. They ever wonder, like, why is that? And the answer is, Plato, <laughs> weirdly enough. Now, as he sees it, going with the analogy, you know, you've got the physical world, and we see stuff by the radiation of the sun. That's how we're able to see. Now, since it's an analogy, the idea is that how then do we see, you know, the real, real world? for real. Well, what he claims is, is that in the analogy, the good takes the role of the sun, and it illuminates 
everything that we you know, gaze upon in this metaphysical realm that we see. To this is the sun is the source of you know the physical world, you know, and, you know the energy, the light, you know, life, etc. In the metaphysical world, the good is the cause of all that. It's the author of all knowledge, being, and essence. So it illuminates what we see. Now again, even even now, of course, we still use that metaphor. The idea of the you know seeing things by the light of reason, and it later became in the Middle Ages and later known as the natural light of reason, this faculty of illumination, which again still sticks today. We talk about being illuminated, <coughs> enlightened, seeing the light, etc. And it comes from the large part, you know, Plato, that metaphor. Now, if you look at it, you might also see parallels to religious thought. Whereas, you know, Plato has the good being the cause of everything that illuminates everything, that is the source of all knowledge being in essence. And if you just change one word, of course, you get God or gods. And so the parallels to religion are you know, pretty clear, which is why during the Middle Ages, many Christian thinkers claimed, although many disputed, the claim that Plato and Aristotle were Christians before Christianity, or so they claimed. Other scholars said that's BS. They were just you know, smart pagans. Now, We now turn to the famous line. Before going to line, though, anything about the previous stuff that needs more stuff stuff. Now in the Republic, Plato, or the character of Socrates, lays out the famous law. It's considered one of those like important things in like you know, uh, Western thought and you know, human thought in general. And so here's the law. So Plato, or rather Socrates, draws out a line dividing reality up into four categories. And it's the reverse of the usual grade category. So like in grades, A is best, you know, D is bad. And the way he does a line is D is best, A is worst. And so he splits it up in the following categories, D, C, B, and A. Now the lowest level of the line, and the disproportionality is potential. That wasn't just like you know, doing a crappy job. Uh, because the way he describes it is some parts are bigger than, than others. Now the lowest level for Plato, level A, is the realm of images. This would include literal images, paintings, and today, of course, it includes you know movies, photographs. It also includes you know hallucinations, shadows, and so on. So, literally, images, all the stuff that is part of art, but also again hallucinations, the shadows, etc. All the things that are merely images of things. Now, Plato believes for each of the levels, not only is there like, you know, kind of a type, you know, in this case, images, there's also a corresponding faculty of the mind that deals with that. And on the lowest level, it's our imagination, because we imagine stuff. Now, some people may take issue with that, because we're often told that imagination is like, you know, really important to imagine and create all this stuff. What Plato has in mind here is literally, you know, imagining things picturing things that are not real. Now, to make sense of like why that stuff is stuck at the lowest level, here's a little bit of what Plato says about art. In the same book, The Republic, Plato argues that art is corrupting. And it's an argument, if you've ever heard arguments for censorship, it's still the argument that's used today. Pretty much anyone who makes this argument, is, well, anybody who uses this argument is basically using, even if they don't know it, they're using Plato's argument. And it went like this. Plato believed that if you were exposed to art, it would have a corrupting influence. He focused on art involving you know, tragedy, art involving comedy, and of course, what we focus most on today, sex and violence. And the argument was basically if you were exposed to that in the art, it will corrupt your soul. You will become more inclined, like in the case of tragedy, to be weepy and sad. In the case of comedy, more inclined to play the fool. In the case of you know, violence, more inclined to be violent. In the case of you know, seeing sex, more inclined to be promiscuous and badly behaved. And that's the argument we hear today. When someone cranks on an argument against Grand Theft Auto or a movie, they say if the kids see this, they'll become violent. It goes back to play. So he considered art to be really dangerous. He also considered it to be basically inferior. It was essentially, think of it like a painting. 
a painting is just a copy of you know the physical world. Wish for play was just a copy of the of reality. So they literally are just illusions and images. So he, he really considered that stuff to be bad. So for him, all that stuff is in the lowest level, the least. It's not nothing, but it's the least of things. And again, his view is pretty, even though he actually kind of liked art, his view was that it was highly corrupting and harmful, so it had to be banned from the ideal state. And all the arguments we have for censorship today pretty much go back to that. Art is corrupting, we must ban it to protect the children. The next level up, level B, is the realm, this is where we hang out, the physical world. Stuff like, you know, tables and water bottles and shoes and so forth. And the way we know about, well, we don't know, the way we, the faculty we have corresponding to this is belief. We have beliefs about this. We can't know it according to Plato because of the sense arguments. It's constantly changing, you know, it's not eternal, so we just have beliefs about it. They can be true, but we can never really know. Why not? Well, I gave the illustration of like, you know, the car. I parked my truck. It wasn't on fire when I left. It wasn't being towed when I left. But for all I know, it could be on fire now or being towed or being towed while it's on fire. All kinds of things could be happening. And so I believe it's okay, but of course I don't know. And of course, even when I see my truck, I still won't know because I could be, you know, confused or deluded or hallucinating or something. So the physical world is this stuff. More real than this. You know, there's nothing, which is nothing. There's this, which is just above nothing. And this, which is above, you know, the lesser stuff, but still lesser. The next step up is level C. This is the realm of the, what people call, or Plato called the mathematicals, the lesser forms. And this is the realm of, uh, what can we call like intelligence? But here's the, the idea. To use a, well, not really a concrete illustration because it's pretty abstract, but to use a particular illustration, this is the realm of, for Plato, geometry and logic to illustrate. What sort of defines this level is that you use symbols to represent. For example, you could have. You know, something like that, a little, little logic bathroom. Actually, probably invisible because of my crappy expo mark. And of course, we have, we do, if you ever have the class in geometry, you, know, you do proofs in geometry. And when you're doing, you know, geometry, you're using, you know, x, y axis, and you're drawing like triangles and, and stuff, and then doing the various, you know, uh, formulas. And the idea is like the first sort of mark is you use symbols to represent stuff. So this stands for the logic -y stuff. The mathematic stands for the mathematic -y stuff. The, the geometric shapes stand for the geometricals. And we know, of course, that you know, if we know from geometry that the circles or that we draw on paper are not perfect, but they represent the perfect, you know, abstractly they represent the perfect circles. So we use the symbols to represent and stand for things that are you know, perfect. The second part is, we get to our proofs by a series of steps. So if you've done like, if you took, you know, geometry and remember it, I remember taking it vaguely, but you know, I remember doing badly on proofs. Or like in logic, which I do remember, you know, doing, doing proofs. And the idea is step by step, you prove it, get to a certain result. And so for Plato, that's that level of stuff. And you can have knowledge here. You can know that stuff. The highest level, according to Plato, is level D, which is the realm of the, the ideas and the true forms, and this is the realm of rational intuition. So this would be the level where you know we have beauty, justice, etc. Now, what makes that kind of special is this: the level beneath it, we use the assembly things, and we use steps and proofs. You know, we do like a mathematical proof or geometric proof or a logical proof. At the highest level, though, you don't use symbols or proofs. There is this rational intuition, the light of you know, knowledge, the light of reason, the illumination. Now, that, this level, of course, is 
in many ways the most mysterious because I mean, we can work out the details so that you can do a proof. This is like just simply being enlightened and seeing the truth. Now the reason why this is still important, I guess, today is because it still is an influence. I mean, we do, of course, you know, regard mathematics and geometry and logic as being certain, more reliable than the senses. And people still talk about, you know, sort of seeing things through the light of intuition, just knowing the, the truth. But of course it's super mysterious, because it's not like a, by the way that, that supposedly works, you don't work on like a proof, you see the truth. You have that, you know, that insight to the true nature of reality, according to Plato. Now of course, as Locke pointed out, people can be you know, kind of mistaken about that. They may think that they have a flash of insight and they see the truth, but they're totally wrong and perhaps dangerously you know, insane. So that's the famous line. Quick recap, it breaks reality and knowledge down into four categories, the least of which is the level of images, dealing with imagination. This is things like shadows, hallucinations, and art. This is the least of things. Level B is the physical world that we live in, the realm of, you know, desk, tables, chairs, kiwis, the fruit, and the bird, roast beef sandwiches, you know, Uber cars, etc. And this deals with belief, not knowledge. Then you get the level C, which is the mathematicals, which deals with, you know, logic and math, which can be knowledge, because we can be certain about it. And then the highest level is the idea of the, the true forms, which we know not by proofs or demonstrations or by symbols, we just know through this faculty of, you know, essentially rational intuition, however that works. And this is probably the toughest one because, again, we can do proofs and check them, and if someone just says, you know, I see with a pure light of, you know, reason, this, whatever, we really have no way of checking their work, so to speak. And it's hard to tell when someone is truly enlightened and someone who is, like, truly dangerously insane. Or both. Before pressing along, anything about the line that needs more line stuff? Now one thing that Plato is probably super famous for, because we made into like you know, movies, is the allegory of the cave. And again, if you want to see the allegory of the cave with like a big budget and special effects and I guess some kind of acting, uh, Matrix, basically. The algorithm of the cave is the matrix, only with like big budget and guns, lots of guns. But here's the idea. Drawn out um, badly. Plato asks us to imagine the following scenario. got a cave and what's going on is is this in the cave there's a wall and behind the wall there's a fire burning and behind the wall in front of the fire are badly drawn people carrying objects on sticks now the reason why Plato has to do this of course is because in his time they didn't have the obviously the technology for like projectors and films and so forth but you can imagine this you know jump it up to like more modern times, you could replace this with like a projector, you know, projecting stuff. But of course they had projectors then, so you had to use the fire and basically people carrying objects. And then in the cave itself, there are people who are in these chairs, kind of like people in a movie theater, but they're you know, locked in place, so they can't look around. And what happens is, is that you know, the people behind the thing walk by with sticks, and they have, you know, various objects on them. The fire casts the shadows on the wall, and they make noises. Like they're walking by with, like, you know, a pig shape on a stick. They make, you know, pig noises. They walk by with, like, a, you know, squirrel on a stick. They make, like, squirrel noises, etc. Now, initially, of course, people who are here in the metaphor think they're seeing the real world. Because they don't, you know, they can't look around, and they don't know any better. So 
they regard that as reality. And this, of course, corresponds to level A, the level of shadows and illusions. But Plato asks us to imagine someone who, you know, slips free. They're like, you know, sitting in the chair and, you know, loosen up the restraints and get an, get an arm free, and they're able to set themselves free. And the person is loose in the cave. So that scenario, that's like level B. So the person is, you know, loose in the cave, able to see, you know, the situation. Of them. You, they can see the people, you know, you know, tied up in these chairs, can see the fire behind there. And of course, initially the fire is kind of blinded because the person is used to the shadows. And the person, you know, being pretty brave and pretty curious, then tries to escape. So hops up on the wall, jumps, you know, past the people. Now, when the person's loose in the cave for Plato, that's level B. Essentially, the person has realized that the stuff they were being shown before it was just shadows and illusions, basically deceptions. And in the cave, they're in what corresponds to the physical world. So they realized that what they were seeing before was all unreal, essentially all lies, and that they're in this what Plato you know, regards as the physical world. Now, of course, it's still more. The person is you know, here, and they realize there's a way out. So this isn't all there is. So the person like hops up, you know, jumps over the wall, clambers over the fire, and then heads out into the real world. And that's the next level of the line. So outside of the cave, of course, the person has gone from you know, a dim, dark cave, illuminated only by a fire, into the light of the outside world. And the person is, not surprisingly, you know, blind. It's like going from you know, being inside a dark room in Florida and stepping outside into the sunlight. It's kind of blinding. So at first, the person cannot look at the full light of day. If you've seen The Matrix, it, this corresponds to the part, you know, when uh, the character Neo is, you know, in the tubes, and doesn't know he's in the tubes, he's in The Matrix, that's being in The Matrix. That's level, that's A. The person has no idea that this is anything other than a real. And then when, you know, the Morpheus uh, contacts Neo, that's like level B. He realizes that th this isn't real, that you know, there's something else. And then when he is broken, you know, broken out of the tube and dumped into basically into the sewers, that's like being you know, outside for the first time. And this line of the Matrix where you know, Neo asks Morpheus, you know, why, do, why do my eyes hurt? And he says to him, because you've never, you've never used them. It's you know, drag rip off of you know, Plato's allegory of the king. So this is like being outside of the matrix. You're in the real that is real for the first time. Now initially, of course, the person cannot you know, bear the full light of day. So they can they you know, you rely on like reflections or they go around like by moonlight. But eventually, of course, the person's eyes adjust. They grow accustomed to the light of the sun. And they're able to bear the full light of reality. And then, of course, is being, you know, fully aware of what's really real for real. Now, the free person, of course, outside of the cave, would, from their standpoint, they would see themselves as being incredibly fortunate. That those people that are still chained in the cave, staring at shadows, are in bad circumstances. And he certainly would not regard, you know, the honors and awards and, and so forth the wealth of the cave to have any value because he, he or she knows it's all shadows, it's all fake. I mean, to use another crack analogy, be like, um, this is kind of like a video game. You know, if someone says, I've got you know, a million gold in Warcraft, it's like, well, you, know, you really can't buy anything of that. It's fake stuff type of deal. Now, here he is foreshadowing, but of course, it's kind of a cheat as a foreshadow because. Plato, who's writing it, knows how the story ends, because it's written after you know, Socrates' death. And he said if someone would return to the cave, it would be just like, you know, literally going from light to darkness. So you've been outside, like in the bright floor of sunshine, and you go into like a darkened room, you can't, you can't see, because your eyes haven't adjusted. And if a person was, you know, forced, 
to compete and try to contend in the shadows, they would, of course, do poorly because they wouldn't be able to, to see things that well. And, of course, the person would think, why would I want to compete for shadows, for things that really have no meaning or value? people fighting over things that are even real. Now, but interestingly or boringly enough, from the standpoint of people who are you know, stuck there, they would see the person who's escaped and returned as being a, you know, an incomp incompetent, ineffective person. Because they would be very well at the, at the games of the cave, you know, guessing what's going to appear next, etc. And the person who knows it's all illusion would do poorly because their eyes would still be, you know, you know, basically unadjusted, and they'd realize they're competing over nothing, over make-believe stuff. But of course, from the standpoint of people in the cave, that person would be just pathetic. You know, they wouldn't be able to play the game well, they wouldn't put any value on it, they'd be seen as, as foolish. And if the person tried to free other people and said, you know, you're, you're playing with shadows, none of this matters, you know, just see the truth, become enlightened, they would be angry and try to kill the person. And of course, again, this is foreshadowing because this is exactly what happens to, as, Socrates, as Plato knows, happens to Socrates. As we saw in the Apology, he tries to take people out of the darkness and for his troubles is put to death. So that is the initial allegory of the cave. Now this, of course, corresponds to Plato's you know, metaphysics and epistemology. Being in the cave is the level A, basically the realm of you know images, shadows, and illusions, the realm of the unreal. Being loose in the cave is you know, kind of the first step towards having you know actual belief. That is level B, you know, physical objects, etc. And then being out and able to sort of kind of see in the shadows, level C, and then full awareness, full enlightenment would be level D. And the, you know, in the physical world, the fire corresponds to our physical sun. And of course, the, you know, the sun of the true outer world corresponds to the, the good. So it's a journey out of the shadows into the light of, of knowledge. Which again has become kind of a standard metaphor in human thought. You know, thanks in large part to our good dead friend, Plato. And it's also a standard metaphor for education, that of the, the lies and illusions that we are taught to find the truth on one's own. So that's the famous allegory of the cave. And again, if you want to see like a more high-budget version with lots of explosions and guns, The Matrix, always a classic. So with diagram form, here's the layout. We've got um, the cave with people in chains, Correspond with the world of illusion, imagination, images, and sensations, and people think that, that stuff is real, but they're totally wrong. Being loose in the cave, realm of belief and sense perception, and the fire is like the sun of the physical world. And these are but the images of ideas. Then, being semi free, this is understanding stuff, you know, in the reflected light of the moon, so to speak. And then the highest level, of course, is being fully liberated, being seeing the, the good. And Plato thinks that, uh, because of what Socrates did, that people who do achieve this freedom uh, should go back and try to rescue other people, and then they would be killed for doing that. So that's the allegory of the cave. Now, to finish up, for Plato, the good, pretty important thing. It is the author of all things, beautiful and right, the Lord of light and the visible world, a source of reason, truth, and the intellectual. And as you can see, I mean, the parallels between the good and for people who are monotheists, between God, pretty clear, very similar concept. Which is why, again, people in the Middle Ages who were thinkers, what they thought was is that Plato, despite being pagan, had a sort of, ironically, a dim view of God, that the good was the pagan conception of God. Because it plays a similar role. You know, God perfectly good, creates everything, you know, Lord of light, you know, creator of everything, you know, you know, truth, etc. So probably the best way to understand the good, in Plato's sense, is to think of, you know, God. 
except for Plato, the good is not like a personal being. Um, it is like a metaphysical, purely metaphysical entity. It doesn't like feel or care. People who have seen the good, of course, will generally not want to go back into the, the shadows. But if they do so, they will seem to behave ridiculously. Why? Well, again, this is foreshadowing, but not really, because obviously Plato knows what's going to happen. But he says in a court of law, someone will behave ridiculously. They, having seen absolute justice, they won't be you know, repressed by the shadows. They'll be more concerned with truth than with the games of justice. So, again, it's basically foreshadowing his, his own doom through, through Plato. Now, in terms of how the knowledge stuff works, going back to like how I know about this stuff, his view is, is that the soul has this capacity to learn stuff. And in order to, to learn, what we have to do is basically, by the analogy, the eye analogy, the eye you know, can't go from darkness to light without the whole body going. So everything, the whole soul, must be turned from you know, the realm of becoming to be by movement of the whole soul. And again, in the Mino, we see that literally the way it goes is you die, soul goes off to hang with the forms, you learn stuff, reborn, etc. Now to close. Now interestingly, there's a final point. He does note um, one that's later picked on, picked up by, by other thinkers is this, that he talks about the clever, clever rogue. And what he's presenting here is kind of the dangers of learning stuff. And it's kind of an interesting point. Namely, a person who acquires this kind of knowledge either can become you know, something very useful or something hurtful and useless. How so? Well, it brings forth the idea of the clever rogue, namely, a person who can see very clearly to their end, they are the reverse of the blind, but the keen sight you know, serves evil. And basically the person is dangerous in proportion to their cleverness. So I just kind of make an interesting point here about how you know, both you know, being, I guess, really good, having this you know, understanding that, that serves the good, and being one who is evil but has great understanding and keen intelligence, makes someone far more dangerous. Later, a later thinker we looked at before, Immanuel Kant, presents a similar view of this. He notes, as we'll see when we talk about Kant and his ethics, that the most dangerous villain is someone who has all these other good qualities. Because if, if you have someone who's like lacking, they're evil but they're just totally incompetent, they're more like a comic, you know, cartoon villain. You know, like in, you know, like in, in children's cartoons. You know, you get a villain who's like bad, but they're totally incompetent in their badness. They never actually, their plans never work, nothing ever succeeds. So they're bad, but incompetent. And the truly dangerous villains, as Khan argues, are those who have all these great qualities, except for that evil. And Plato kind of notes that, that challenge here, the very competent evil. And then Plato dies, still is today, and, but he said a lot of stuff, and we still talk about him, so I guess that's good. So have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday for more stuff.